is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. A track whose barriers are less tech pro and more earthen embankment. Trees lining the circuit with a good chance the car could run into them. Very few places where a pass doesn't risk your safety. Yep, I'd say this circuit is a perfect fit for a 60s F1 car. There's just one catch. It's only two miles long. It's a bullring type scenario for our drivers today, so we'll undoubtedly be treated to a little bit of unpredictability. We'll see who comes out the other side as we get ready to watch round six of the Lotus 49 World Cup. And you'll see it all live here on the Global Sim Racing Channel. Hi, I'm Joe Peek, and with me in the booth is Johan Vandenbelt. Behind the scenes is our director, the Dr. Amjad Yaman, and he's using cameras provided by Dougie Beard. Johan, welcome to Summit Point. It's a place many iRacers know by heart if they were on the road side of things, but our viewers who aren't hardcore race fans might not know this place. Exactly. Summit Point Motorsports uh, Park, the raceway of today, is located in Summit Point, West Virginia. One of the trademarks of iRacing, this track was constructed in 1970. Now, throughout the years, Summit Point has hosted motorcycle races, karting events, open wheel races, but mostly the track is known for hosting sports car races. Arguably, the most famous was the 12 hours at the point race that was hosted between 1999 and 2008. Nowadays, however, the track is mostly used for amateur races, but also for driving training sessions for local and federal law enforcement. And like you say, Joe, most people who've dabbled in road racing on the surface have driven at Summit Point. It is one of the three tracks of the surface and offers a bit of everything in low, uh, low powered cars. You have a reasonably long straight, uh, slow infield section sandwiched between several fast speed corners. Today, however, in these old Formula One cars, it will for sure present a very interesting challenge. Overtaking will be extremely difficult around this narrow track and having a good lap in qualifying will be key for victory. And to see how that looks like, let's hop on board our GSC Lotus 49 for a lap around Summit Point. All right, we've got Simon Shaw on the GSRC Lotus 49, so let's do a lap around Summit Point. Down the front stretch, turn one is really your only good opportunity to overtake. Every other braking zone is going to be a compromise. That means anyone who thinks they'll be susceptible will probably be defending early. But the tricky thing about this corner is the way it opens up on the exit, making it tough to get the power down. From out of there, you've got very little time before wagon wheel. This little rise in the corner means it's easy to wind up understeering into the gravel to the outside. This little straight isn't very straight, so be careful not to lose the car by clipping the grass. Then comes the braking for four, which bleeds directly into yard sale corner. The high speeds, kink in the braking, and limited runoff make this thing terrifying. Now you're into the technical back half of the circuit, where there'll be very little time that your foot is fully on the throttle. The long right-hander of the carousel might make you want to let the car drift out, but ideally you'll hug the inside of every exit to set up for the following corner. That eventually culminates in turn 9, and finally the engine gets to unwind for a bit. Before you know it though, you've got more braking into the final turn. You'd think this would offer a good overtaking opportunity, but there's another little jink in the track on entry, and it's actually not a very slow corner. From there, get the power down smoothly and confidently, and hopefully you finish the lap around Summit Point. There you see the quick laps we were talking about this course, barely over a minute long, so they're going to be rifling off a lot of them. We'll go over that in a second. Before that, let's get to the championship standings and see where that sits now that we are halfway through the season. Dave Price still leading Ove Trangere, but it is a mere three points, and that is mostly due to the drop weeks coming into play. That switches them around uh, between first and second. The other three in our top five stay where they are. Kochi only 16 points back, and then it's a huge drop, surprisingly, to the Frenchman, Michel Dudignan, who's trying to come back to the four after missing some races and having some bad races. Marco Kika will be starting in, or not starting in fifth, but sits in fifth, excuse me. Uh, the Finn, about 56 points back with a pretty good season for him. We also have the amateur championship, which they call the F2 championship here, Johan. 
Yeah, in the Formula 2 Championship, it has been Marcellus Groening who has been leading so far. 41 points collected. The American had a, a bad run last week around in Interlagos, but still managed to score more points than his nearest competitors and is uh, leading by 13 points towards his country. Man, Andrew Eng. Alex Cameron is behind him, 19 points behind the leader, and then you see two charges coming freshly hot in the top five. Hideki Corfisto, our runner up from last season, is now only 21 points behind Marcellus Bruining, and Don Good won seven places in Interlagos. Currently, currently sits fifth, five points behind Corfisto. Yeah, he was uh, bumped up a few places by our two main point scorers running into each other there at Interlagos. So, Let's uh, take a look at the Constructors' Championship. Uh, you can see uh, with Claridge and Price uh, having some good results so far this season. Claridge not so much, only 35 on the board. Uh, they've got up to 168 points. That's scored them quite a few over Norway at this point. Uh, Trangrade carrying the torch there. Nicola Kochi, the lone Italian, doing pretty good uh, to get himself up into third. Now, the United States it doesn't have a lack of trying to get up there. Look at all the drivers that have been scoring for them. That does bump them up at least to fourth, but they got a ways to go. Really got to be scoring more at a time. And then uh, Wright, Bear, and Zoko bringing Australia up two positions into fifth. What about the race details, Johan? What are we looking at for today's race? And the race today at Summit Point is round six of our 12-round championship. Two drop weeks uh, this uh, championship means that the two worst results of each driver will be removed at the end of the season. 28 laps will go today. Now, as you could see in the lap guide, that will go by fairly quickly around here. Uh, setups are open. It means that the drivers can tweak it just to their liking. As since last season, we have a new scoring that gives 40 points to the victim. And if you enjoy this sort of racing, you can, of course, subscribe to the iRacing Esports Network, which you're watching right now. And uh, you can see all kinds of official racing as well as the World Championship. You can jump over and watch that uh, in a little bit. Of course, uh, they cover all the World Championships here on IESN. Mick Claridge just put his second time in, but he does not improve. He'll be followed quickly by Dudignan. Let's see if he can topple him for the pole. And yes, he can. By just a little less than a tenth, Michelle Dudignan going to be starting on the top spot. So that's going to be an interesting one today. Let's see if Michelle can try and rebound after having uh, some unfortunate incidents so far this season. Yeah, and the difference that Michel Dudion just made is that he actually managed to be quicker in the second lap time than McLaren. McLaren made a, a small mistake, lost three tenths of a second in his second lap time, and because of that, he lost out on the pole position. So it's Dudion leading at the moment. We're seeing here Andrew Eng on screen. Andrew Eng, one of the people in the Formula 2 Championship, he almost loses his car there coming out of the S section. Currently sitting in 21st position. This would be his third qualifying lap, so I don't think that uh, it wouldn't be classified anymore. He's just trying to get some extra lap time out there. Yeah, and there's plenty of time to get some extra laps around this place. The driver who is trying to get a second time in is Matt Yeomans in 24th. He's currently coming out of the carousel through the S's. And the car will finally get to speed up for at least a little while before you come over that hump over the bridge, breaking for the final corner. I have to imagine that probably makes the braking a little bit hairy when you first stab on them. Yeah, absolutely. I, I always found it was a very difficult to really find a good braking position, a good braking point in that corner because, well, you have the little king just before it. Matt comes across the line there, goes slightly quicker. Uh, 1097 this time around. Michael Morrison in his uh, purple pink Egyptian car is coming across the start finish line almost. He hasn't set a lap time yet. He hasn't done a qualifying lap. I think this will be the first one. It yes, 1082. So 10th so place for Michael Morrison. And he'll have enough time for one more. And the official Wikipedia color apparently for the Egyptian colors that he's got in there is violet. I understand. So there's <laughs> it, your fact of the day. <laughs> <laughs> the car's pilot then, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep that in mind. And you can see him here going through, uh, I think that's Wagon Corner, Wagon Band, going towards Yardstow Corner. And this is probably one of the key corners in the race, I think, Joe, especially in the opening lap when all these cars will just constantine towards each other. Yeah, it's going to be hard to tell who's doing what with the way that that kink makes it uh, sort of hard to tell if somebody's going to defend or not. 
and everybody's probably going to be wanting to hold somebody off with, like you said, them being so close together. I mean, I mean, it's already difficult in other cars to go side by side through the little kink before the corner, and especially in these cars to go side by side, it's almost a death warrant that you that you ride for yourself. It will be extremely difficult to do that. Yeah, I'm My looking forward to seeing how this race plays out. Morrison crosses the line. Does he improve? No, he does not. So 10th will be the best he can do. That's the last of our cars to put a lap time in. So let's go through our starting grid. Michelle Dudignan will be on the pole with Mick Claridge next to him. Now, we should point out there were no hard feelings after they clattered together at Interlagos last week, but this is definitely going to be round two for that win. Ove Trangrade is going to hope to spoil it. He'll start from third with a second row completed by Dimitri Kudeludis in uh, third, fourth place, excuse me. Rob Olenek will be starting fifth. Nikola Kochi will be P6. Marco Kika, he might be fifth in the points, but he's going to be starting from seventh on the grid today. He'll have some climbing to do. Phil Lake will be P8 with JB Hall starting in ninth. Michael Morrison rounds out our top 10. In the first car on row six is Daniel Cedro. He starts in the double 11 spot and he shares that row with Paul Foster in P12. Behind him, uh, Ian Haycox is back. He starts the race in P13. Next to him, Philippe Urquhart. He did a quick that hard charge are currently in the Formula 2 championship. He starts the race today right in the midfield. B15, and he's being flanked by Marco Archidiacono. Mercedes Bruyne, the leader in the Formula 2 Championship, starts in P17. And next to him, David Rossi. And the last two drivers in the top 20, Alex Cameron in P19 and Don Good in P20. Daniel Blackman starts 21st with Andrew Ang next to him in 22nd. Then you've got Tobias Stingel starting 23rd. Matt Yeomans will be 24th with Antonio Archidiacono starting 25th. Gary Anderson is in 26. Last car to put a time in is Donald Dickerson. Then you've got Robert Reynolds, Robert Reynolds and Jeff Olney uh, ending out the field here today. They are gritting up now. We're waiting for them to get out on the field. There you can see it is a lot of cars out here. Even in lower powered cars, this would be a huge field here at Summit Point. We're expecting these uh, high-powered F1 machinery to really have a bit of a tricky, tri tricky time staying out of one another. We'll see if we have any sort of pileup down into turn one where there is heavy braking into that first hairpin and also pretty much the only good opportunity to pass. As, uh, it could cause some incidents with drivers being eager to try to get by their opponents knowing it could be their only time they are close by here in this 28 lap race. Phil Lake out there running once again with Rob Olenek. They keep coming back and they finally had some good results last race. So just hoping they can repeat that. I think they're finally getting a handle on the car. Just waiting on two more of these machines to find their way out to the grid. You can see those earthen embankments that I talked about with the trees right there ready to collect you could see some cars disappear off into the ether if they spin out. All right, everybody is out there. So the engines start to rev as the lights come up here in round six of the Lotus 49 World Cup. Green flag is out. Michelle Dudignan, a much better start off the line. Mick Claridge, oh, he gets a, a better ha second half to the start. Look at the squirming that Michelle Dudignan experienced coming down to the hairpin. This could give it up as now an edge goes to Mick Claridge. They try to get to the gas as one of the cars behind them slips behind. And finally, Mick Claridge makes the pass. And Demetrius Hudeludis was one of the drivers almost hitting the grass there. Kept it in a straight line, loses a few positions back to P5 at the moment, but it's single foul throughout Wagon's Bend. Now down into yard sale corner, Claridge still well clear ahead. All the cars squeezed together behind them. Oh, we do have an accident, and that is going to be the car of Hideki Koivisto. And we'll get to it in a second. Also have Alex Cameron and Marcellus Brunin involved. The leader and one of the hard charges in the Formula 2 championship there. But in front, uh, we still have Mick Claridge on the leader already come around to complete the first lap and Michel Dudignan a little wobbly through that final corner looks like he's under threat from Ove Trangere these three making a little bit of a breakaway back to the fourth car Rob Olenek and then there's a huge gap back to fifth for Huda Ludis. 
I'm, I'm curious now how easy it will be for, uh, be for McLaren to defend this position. I saw the drivers talking earlier in the week that once you're leading, it's very easy to defend, or at least easier than in other tracks, while he's being haunted at the moment by the Frenchman, who's trying into turn three. Looking very similar to last week. Already Michel poking his nose out left and right, trying to see if there's a way to get around. Defense down in a yard sale from Mick Claridge, so nothing doing there. Ove Trangere just waiting in the popcorn position, waiting patiently. Uh, this is probably one of the corners that you have to give up a little bit. Both cars are doing it to have a good exit here. Just following each other. Michel Dudion going a little bit wider. Taking a little bit more speed towards Paddock Bend here, the last corner of the track. Now this, we said it before, is the most important. If you can get a good exit here, you might be able to try and overtake. Now look at this, uh, how close Michel Dudillon is there. McLaren immediately has to defend the inside, hugs it completely. Dudillon around the outside. Will he be able to break a little bit later, swing it around? It doesn't seem likely. McLaren slides on a little bit, maybe then they can't. Ooh, completely cut off there. And look at over Trangrade getting close behind the two. Almost looked like there may have been a little bit of net code contact, but we'll see. Don't see any damage on the front of Dudignan's car. This is definitely keeping Ove Trangrate in the mix as these three are battling over the lead early on. Turn five once again, checking everybody up a little bit wide through the corner from Mick Claridge, but there's just no place to get around for Michelle Dudignan. He is just caught up in this traffic jam at this point. Even Olenek is now behind them. Exactly. When you make a small mistake, especially in the infield section, you just park your car in the apex and the car behind you just cannot go around it. It's, it's quite easy to defend, especially in that part of the track. And like we said, it just shows how important qualifying was. If you're in front, it's just quite easy to stay in front of the rest if you don't make mistakes. Like you said, Rob Olenek is uh, hopping by a little bit as well. Four car train now for the lead. McLaren slightly defending the inside, but already coming back. Not as much pressure this time around, but maybe over Trangerate can provide some pressure now on the French driver. A little bit calmer. We've been waiting with a replay queued up. I think now we've got an opportunity for Hideki Cuevisto's incident. There was a third car that uh, spun on his own in that as well. This is down into turn four and five that we'll see it happen. This is Cuevisto, the Finn. They're watching the blue, red and white machine. Oh, did he lose it or did he get yeah. tipped? It was hard no. to tell from that angle. I think he lost it on his own in that corner. Marcelo's Bruyne just didn't have any place to go. Just collected the Finnish driver and uh, well, both of them were in the wall. Hideki Corfisto in the meantime has retired uh, from this race. Marcelo's Bruyne is still driving around. He's currently in 23rd. Yeah, we watched from on board the Texans view and he was just at a horrible place at a horrible time. Oh, and there was a car off in the... Uh, who was that? Oh, that was Tobias. Uh, Stingel there who has stopped inside the carousel. He gets it going, but he's down in 23rd. Not in last place. Still got quite a few cars running. 27 of our 29, 28 out of our 29, Phil Lake has gotten back out there, are still on course. Now in front of the field, it's still extremely close between both Mick Claris and Michel de Neon going to turn three as we speak. This is just not one of the oh yeah little wiggle there for Michel Dudion. This is just such a difficult place to try and move. You can try and do a dive bump or something like that here, but it's just such a risk to to, to try and make the overtake. You really want a good exit from the last corner and make an overtake stick. But look at over Trangerate. He's starting to push more and more towards Dudion to get a P2 position. I know it's a Saturday race, but it's been a little bit more like Freaky Friday lately because. Uh, Michel Dudignan in the past few races has had a very loose car and usually we expect that from Mick Claridge. Yeah, exactly. It, it seems like he just twists and especially when uh, on throttle, he just twists his car a little bit. Like maybe he's not completely comfortable with it or he just tries something else and he's doing it. On the outside once again, breaking later this time around. Michel Dudignan going into turn one. Mick Claridge slides a little bit. Oh, Dudignan has to take the long way around. Almost gave the opportunity to Trangrate again on throttle, just sliding, squirming very close now towards turn three. Once again around the outside, you can't put it side by side here, but it's very difficult. Starts to slide, uh, going through the gravel, that gives over Trangrate and drop all the neck positions. One position, two position, all the way back to fourth for Michel Dudignan. 
Rob Olenek up to third. Ove Trangrade is now going to get an opportunity. Let's watch the replay there. The outside of an off-camber corner seems like a very tough ask, no matter how you spin it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's easy. Uh, hindsight is 20-20. You can always wonder if that was the best position to try and overtake. But the point of the matter is that it didn't work out. He loses two positions. And this is great news for McLaren, who is seemingly driving a little bit away from over Trangere. He uh, hasn't had this much of a gap going over start finish line uh, well, since the race started. Maybe the British driver can now start to create a gap to the rest of the field. And that mistake has even brought in Dimitri Houdelutis, our fifth place driver. And it could be six pretty soon because Nikola Kochi is a scant seven tenths behind our fifth place driver. Things are just stacking up further and further. I have a feeling something's going to erupt with the way we're getting more and more cars involved. Exactly. Well, a six car battle seems likely. The two drivers behind them are also in a nice battle. Those are Jamie Hall in P8 and Marco Kika in P7. Uh, the Finnish driver is still in front, they're currently 1.1. Oh, extremely close there by Jamie Hall, who almost outbreaks himself and touches Marco Kika in guard the corner. Uh, the duo is around 1.1 seconds behind the six-car lead group. Uh, so if the, the battle keeps going on there, they will probably get closer and make it an eight-car battle. Oh, who is that off Ooh, there? Donald that Dickerson. is Yeah, Dickerson just having some trouble. He's a lap car, so we'll stay with these lead cars battling it out. Coming onto the main straight, looks like Jamie Hall loses a little time through Paddock Bend. Up in front of them, there's no change. Everybody's still all in a straight line down to the first hairpin. I've been just so close for turn one. You can literally throw a blanket over the four. Extremely close, but there's not anyone trying a move at this point. Maybe the drivers have seen what happened if you try a move like Dudillon did a few laps ago and just saw it completely uh yeah fall to pieces and they're just afraid to try to move at this point of the race again lap traffic coming up and that's something that we'll see a lot this race this time is robert reynolds especially in this infield section there's not a place where you want to meet traffic because it's so difficult to pass and get past i think reynolds is going to be having to pull out of the way very soon here it's going to let them by in the s's but this is not going to go well as it switches back some of them being held up including dude and yawn Huda Lewis can't do anything with it, but it does lose them some gap on the top three. Yeah, I wanted to say maybe this gives Huda Lewis a chance to try and move, but he sli slid through the last corner and loses all connection with uh, Dude Young for a move into turn one. A little bit farther back in the field, Don Good is having a very respectable race. He's up to 15th. Usually he's known for being something of a back marker, and right now he's hounding David Rossi for that 14th spot. And, and, and not only is hounding it for the 14th spot, I think if I calculate correctly, this is actually the lead battle for the Formula 2 race this time around. David Rossi is leading that one, Don Good is second at the moment. And especially with all the positions that Don Good gained last time in Interlagos, if he actually manages to overtake David Rossi, uh, here on track, he will do extremely good business for his hopes for a championship in that category. Yep, that highlighter yellow car just following in line for now, hoping for a mistake, a little bit stuck behind him as they work their way into the infield. Can be a time, can be a place where it's tough to pass, but you can gain a lot of ground if you know some secrets through these left, right, left, right sections. They're starting to catch up on Reynolds as well. That lap traffic, ooh, what a big squirm from Rossi coming off of nine to 10. Sorry, uh, over trend rating uh, makes a mistake in turn one, immediately gets overtaken by Rob Olenek. So Rob Olenek brings himself to P2 and over trend rate loses the position. I wanna say this could be the first podium we'll see for Rob Olenek today if he can hold it up here, but he's gonna have to really work for it. The Long-time veteran of Ove Trangerade and the driver of Michel Dudignan, multiple race winner of Michel Dudignan, now heavy on his back to watch the mistake, weaving down the front stretch. Does he break just a little bit late here? Yes, he does. He knows it. He just straight lines it into the corner. 
It's an easy spot to outbreak yourself. Hey? It's a long straight, hard braking zone because it's a hairpin. And especially if you're in the draft of another driver, you just have a higher top speed than you would have while driving alone. So it's easier to catch yourself out and make a mistake like overtrain grade just did. This time around, look at Michel de Dion. He's very close to the Norwegian then. Takes a slight look on the inside. Will he try and move there? You can do it. Keeps looking. Makes the Norwegian a little bit nervous to start to twitch under braking. He doesn't make a move stick, however. Maybe in turn three now. It seems like the Norwegian has a slightly better exit, though. Yeah, there was a very patient moment from Dudignan. I think he could have sent it up the inside if he wanted to. But one thing, as we rode on board, I noticed that we haven't talked about this. Go ahead. Jeffrey five behind him. Nikola Kochi and Dimitris Hulludis going side by side uh, through the king. It was mostly because Dimitris Hulludis made a mistake in turn three. Nothing came of it, though. Sorry. It's okay. Uh, this this track is not uh, this scan of it, at least, is not uh, a more upkept version. Is it pretty bumpy out there? Because these cars do not have downforce to keep them planted. Oh yeah, you. <laughs> it's good that the drivers are not physically sitting in the car because otherwise they need new fillings in their teeth. Because this track is not <laughs> not very smooth out there. Uh, it, it's quite bumpy, and you can see the cars just bounce. Maybe that's also one of the the reasons that cars are just switching a little bit, they're twitching when they go on throttle. It just makes it a little bit more difficult to get the power on. Back here in 11th spot, Filippo Kukart and Marco Archidiacono in a bit of a battle as it looks like Marco's going to look down to the inside. He's much closer than we saw with Dudin Yon. Side by side into the braking zone, into the hairpin. Can Marco get it done? He's got the inside powering off nice and smooth to it. And it looks like the Italian driver is going to move himself into 11th. Meanwhile, up ahead of these drivers, that battle for first is just not going away. We've seen Dudignan try to peel it away from Claridge. We've seen Trangere try to take it away. And now it's Rob Olenek's turn. And so far, he's having trouble getting up to the gearbox of the Brit. Yeah, but the good news for Rob Olenek, though, is that the battle behind him is heating up over Trangere. He's making a slight mistake for the last corner. A little bit wide, they might give up Michel Dudio an opportunity, but the gap between uh, Overtrangreit and Rob Olenek is increasing around the second now. Michel Dudio is very close behind the Norwegian. Once again, he's taking a look on the inside, and once again, he decides not to try and move there. Dive bomb very close in turn one. Taking a look on the inside there on the throttle, Overtrangreit keeping it wide, and that gives the opportunity. You should maybe have cut him off a little bit earlier. Actually, lets him go. Overtrangreit lets himself be passed by Michel Dudio there in turn three. Oh, but he could get it back. Look at how the gravel to the outside slowed him up a little bit. Ah, not brave enough to try it into yard sale. Well, there goes the, the, the buffer that Rob Olenek had because with Michel Dudillon, who has been quick, who has been the quickest in, in, in qualifying behind you, you know that it will just take a few laps and he's on your gearbox once again. Oh, right what? now, he, he's having trouble trying to shake Trangrade for now in this section of the course. Now he finally gets a little bit of breathing room. One thing that I'm actually well surprised about is that Mick Claris was not able, at least so far, to really gap Rob Olenek. I don't know if that's just difficult to, to really, uh, I don't know, oh, as we see, by the way, almost a move from Overtrangerate, who went very close. But I was wondering, like, he didn't really gap him immediately. There's still a gap of around half a second. Maybe it's the draft helping him stay a little bit there almost going to say because these guys don't give that much draft but still the fact that Mick Claris is still that close to P2 it's surprising to me ah, I we saw in the warm-up that Rob Olenek had a, a very good lap time so I think this is legit pace from Rob this this combination might have something that just jives with him of course he's driven it a, a lot more than these guys over in the Camel GT series, which frequently <laughs> erases this track as he slides his way into the carousel, but doesn't really lose time. So maybe he just knows a, a bit more about this place than these other three drivers. Only on lap 14, just about halfway through this race, I can report, we don't have to go back to it because it happened many laps ago, uh, Antonio Archidiacono and Robert Reynolds came together and unfortunately have had to uh, step out of the track for a moment. Reynolds has repaired his car and come back out there. You can see Antonio, unfortunately, is done for the day.
Boy, we've been focusing up at the front. We've only had little glances at everything else happening farther down. How about 16th, uh, Alex Cameron and Paul Foster fighting for this spot as they come onto the front stretch. Paul with actually a pretty good exit to gain him a little bit of time. See if he can use that momentum to maybe have a go. By looking at qualifying times, Paul Foster was around a second quicker than Alex Cameron. Paul has been falling down uh, field a little bit since the start of the race. Has lost five positions since uh, since the race started. Alex Cameron won in, winning three positions so far. So Paul Foster is just trying to move his way back up the field again, overtake these drivers. Up through wagon wheel once again. I, it looks like Foster just creeping forward bit by bit as we ride on board, looking over his shoulder. Down into the braking, yet again closing in. Big slide though from both of them. Alex Cameron gathers together it wide while Foster was tight into the curb. Both of them continuing on. When the driver in front of you makes a mistake, it's really easy to copy that mistake. You could see it there. Both cars just sliding for yards. Corner once again here, sliding. That's a big mistake from Alex Cameron out of the S as he slides. A bit too much twitching on the throttle. Side by side to the last corner, Paul Foster makes it stick. That's an overtaking maneuver. B16 on exit though. He's not as quick. Immediately, Alex Cameron can put him under pressure, but it seems like he doesn't have the extra speed in the outside line. And Paul Foster can just cover him off towards someone. Yeah, just drifting it back to the racing line to cover him off. And indeed, give P16 to Paul Foster. Next up for him, gonna be Don Good who is still behind Rossi and has actually lost a little bit of touch there. As that was happening, I want to say that Michel Dudignan was looking for a pass on Olenek through turn four, almost made it too wide, but decided better of it. He's since lost a little contact with the American. And actually that battling has dropped them away from Claridge for the first time this entire race. He's got more than a second gap to the car behind. Yeah, this is really good, and especially if the battle keeps going on between Rob Olenek. Ooh, there's a big moment there on the exit of turn one. Oh, you don't have to get Michel Dudillon that he immediately pounces on that mistake. Frenchman back in turn two. Very loose through turn three. That gives Rob Olenek an uh, opportunity. Side by side, going towards the kink. On the outside, Rob Olenek there. Can he make a stick? Side by side still. Turn five. Michel Dudillon breaks later. Again, he gets extremely loose. Saves his car. Ooh, over Trangray gets overtaken. That is by Dimitris Urlutis. Gets contact with Nicola Cocci. Italian gets turned around. Can continue. Stays in P6. That was a chain reaction if I ever saw one. It started with Olenek and Dudignan and worked its way all the way back until poor Nicola Cocci had to suffer the last of it. Look at this. Makes the move. Then another mistake off the corner. The Tiger striped car of Rob Olenek comes back at him in what I consider an incredibly brave move. Up on the curb, almost slides into him. That, uh, it, that could have gone so much worse, but this has just been a mistake-filled race. Meanwhile, uh, more second place action as we're watching the uh, replay here. Yeah, Michel de Dion just got the overtake move stick in turn one to Rob Olenek. I don't know if we can go to a replay of that, but he just had a great exit out of the last corner, have more speed, used to draft a little bit, put it on the inside of Rob Olenek and, uh, and got that P2 position back finally. That was a lot more call maneuver down to the inside, just a simple outbreaking. Looks like Olenek fought it a little bit, tried to cross over, couldn't quite make it happen. So now that Michel has finally got himself back into second place, he's got three seconds to make up. Question is, can he do that? He was faster in qualifying, However, that qualifying time was only a little less than a tenth faster and with about nine laps to go here, is that going to be enough time? Yeah, with only four, four tenths of a second, I don't think he's going to make it until the end of the race now. I had down and suddenly win half a tenth of a second and, and, and really put it down as race pace, it is probably the fence, but you win in three seconds, you probably have to rely on mistakes of Mick Claris or maybe traffic that can be a huge factor. We've seen it several times, especially if you catch it in the infield section, that a driver can just lose one, two seconds. It's almost like you're doing an endurance event. And if that happens, that, that gap can slow down incredibly very quickly. Oh, well, he's got a little bit of a gap before he reaches the next cars ahead. Gary Anderson, Tobias Stingle, and Daniel Blackman. 
See how quickly he comes upon them. Sorry, behind the P11, Marco Cardiacono makes a move on Daniel Sadro. That was a great move on the exit of turn three. Driver was held up by Robert Reynolds, lap traffic, and well, Marco just completely used that momentum to make the overtake. Now, he's really our hard charge as we go to a replay of that incident. Uh, of that overtaking maneuver. Marco is really the high charger of the race today, winning six positions so far, started 16th, now in P10. Great race from the Italian. Yeah, from the onboards, Marco looked as calm as ever. Can't say that it's that way under the helmet necessarily. As we go to seventh place, Jamie Hall and Marco Kika still in a battle. It's been a while since we looked at them, but they're side by side coming through turn one. Nobody's willing to give up. That's Marco in the blue and white car. Jamie Hall in the darker machine to the outside of the wagon wheel corner. He finally gives it up. He could have another go in the yard sale, Johan. Outstanding defensive maneuver from Marco Kika there, who goes a little bit loose through turn four. That, that, the fact that he was on the outside of turn one and actually made the outside line stick, that's not something I have seen before in practice or during the race today. Really good defensive driver from the finish, uh, from the finish driver to, to, to really make that defensive move stick there and not lose a position. Oh, and we've had one of our first violent crashes today. Poor Donnie B. Good. He gets a little loose coming out of turn nine. And you're gonna see why this circuit was not made for machinery of this type. Let's see if we can get this pulled up. Yeah, here we go out of the final, the second to last right-hander just gets a little out of shape. And as he tries to gather it together, oh, he clips that tire barrier and that turns him all the way over. That's going to end his day, sadly. Third yeah. place heating up once again with Huda Lutis and Rob Olenek, Johan. Yeah, the gap between the two going over start finish line was zero thousandths of a second. Absolutely nothing between the two. Demetrius tried it on the outside line uh, through turn one. They went side by side, but he couldn't make the move stick. Now, you we were saying earlier, Joe, that this might be the first podium position for Rob Olenek. Well, he's certainly defending it extremely well. Uh, like his life depending on it because he's not giving the green driver any inch here any opportunity to uh, to really make the move stick once again going to the last corner you really need a good exit here especially if you want to keep Demetrius behind and also over triangulate the Norwegian is not far behind the P5 glad to see Dimitri back and racing this series uh, he disappeared for just a brief while. He came in because of the SRF when they shared the schedule with that series. And it seems like Dimitri really has taken uh, uh, to this old F1 machinery. Right now, though, he's having to fend off train grade close behind that gearbox. And we understand you've caught a crash. We might have to go to it a little bit later, though, because train has got a great run here. Oh, not good enough for an attack, though. So uh, something happened to uh, one of our favorite Italians, Kochi, I understand? Yeah, in the last corner, last time around, he and Marco Kika had contact with each other. And that sent Kochi into a half spin, losing quite a bit of time. You can see it here coming out of the SS section, uh, going towards the last corner. These two drivers will make contact. Nicola Kochi will almost spin his car. He will save it, but he will lose two positions to both Marco Kika and Jamie Hall. Now in the meantime after that, Jamie Hall made a mistake himself in turn three and lost that position immediately. So it seems like all drivers can continue. The positions have shuffled a little. They're very lucky to keep going. That wheel-to-wheel -wheel contact can be a killer in any open wheel car, especially these old Lotus 49s, that low wide stance with the wheels sticking out. They can interlock so easily. Nicola Kochi, you can see, still running in seventh at the moment. The front for pretty much the first time this whole race seems to be mostly spread apart about the only battle still going is this one for fourth place between Dimitri Ove and uh, Rob Olenek. Paul Foster just made an overtake on David Rossi in the last corner. There's the battle for P14. And if I'm correct, that's also the battle for P2 in the uh, amateur category. So also for podium positions there. David Rossi, who was defending his lead while he already was overtaken by Philip Urquhart earlier in the race. And you can see here on the inside in the golden colored car, Paul Foster just making the pass and elevating himself to P14 overall. Yeah, textbook move there. Great stuff from Foster. 
uh, the Australian made the difficult pass in that final corner. We told you about how hard it is trying to break into there. Still wheeling this thing around as the car behind him of David Rossi not only wheels it around, but spins it around down at the yard sale, loses a spot to Alex Cameron. So, as they now have a battle going for eighth place, Hall and Morrison. Morrison, that's another name we've mentioned a lot during this broadcast, was a little bit of no man's land, especially with the gap behind him, 10 seconds to Marco Arcadiacona. But now he has Jamal Hall right in front of him. We saw Jamie Hall involved a bit of an incident a little bit ago. As, uh, oh, and Philip Urquhart, what happened to him here? He was running in a good position. Oh, he blew his engine on downshifts. Oh. Harsh, and especially four laps before the end of the race. That's. I've, uh, I've done that before myself. I remember in Coda one year, I, uh, as we uh, go to the battle for third, Rob Olenek fending off Dimitri Hudalutis. He's got the inside. It's hard to overtake the long way around to the first corner, and he's fending him off for now, but this battle is not over. Yeah, he's squirming, 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 and over and almost took advantage of that on the inside. He really wanted to follow the line of Rob Olenek there, make it a two for one. Uh, but not making it stay going around traffic as Robert Brennan, who gets overtaken, Tobias Stingle right in front of them as well. There will be a little bit more traffic, especially in this slow infield section. Seems like Rob Olenek goes a little bit wide through yard sale corner. And when will you meet to uh, Tobias here? Because the point where you will meet him here might actually mean if he will hurt you or help you. Coming here out of the asset section, I think they will... Yeah, Tobias... Good move there, just stay, yeah, smart driving, just staying there on the inside. Look at how close over Trenger, uh, sorry, Dimitris Hudeludis is there. Going for the last corner, almost <laughs> touching each other there. On the exit, in each other's gearbox, immediately Rob Olenek tries a defensive line. The green driver has to put it around the outside, stays there, but he doesn't really have extra speed. He didn't have to draft, can break a little bit later though, once again. Try to swing it around the outside. We saw Kika do it earlier. Can you do it as well, Demetrius? Under Frotto is just so difficult to really put the power down. Once again, he just cannot make the move stick around the outside there in turn one. Uh, just too much dust and gunk where it's off the racing line. He's trying though, twice now he's been denied. I have to wonder, eventually he'll figure out just how to power off that corner. As we stay on this battle, the story that I was going to say was that uh, once the very first lap of a race at Coda in this series, I, I blew the engine downshifting on the backstretch. As Jamie Hall, or no, actually not Jamie Hall, Marco Kika. Marco Kika was way out in nowhere. He outbraked himself. We might want to get a replay of this. Losing it in turn four and somehow kept it out of the wall. And then you can see how far he slid into the infield. Let's watch from onboard. This is what you were talking about earlier about losing it into turn four and how dangerous this is. Yeah, but also a great move from Marco Kika to not punch it into the wall because that was extremely close there uh, on the inside and actually just keep it going. He kept it in a reasonably straight line, only loses a few positions. So he's currently in P9. Uh, as I see Michael Morrison trying to move on Jamie Hall around the outside of turn one, doesn't make it stick, but he has a group. Ooh, gets very loose there in the kink between turn one and turn three. That hurts him, otherwise he might have been able to try a move here in turn three. Boy, you can't say that uh, people aren't trying hard to make these overtakes. We've seen so many attempts, but we've also seen graphic illustrations of how hard it is to be successful at those attempts. Defensive move to the inside from Jamie Hall as Morrison tries to carry the momentum into the infield, but just does nothing for him. As we watch these two battles, I can report that Dudignan has not gained much time on Claridge. The separation that they experienced really has helped the Brit to carry this thing home because the white flag is coming out now with that 3.2 second gap, giving him a nice little buffer. But it doesn't mean that the podium is settled, though, because Rob Olenek in P3 is still being put under pressure by Dimitris Hudeludis. Not as much as they were early in the race that they went side by side for turn one, but he is there to really pounce on any mistake that Rob makes in the last lap. Gap is slightly increasing while they run towards, P, uh, towards turn three, Joe. 
Ooh, are we going to see a desperate move from Dimitri to get himself onto the podium, or is he going to settle for this spot? He's still relatively close behind. That could hand both of these to Ove Trangerate. Coming through the infield section. We won't have much longer to watch this because right now Mick Claridge coming out of the penultimate turn. Just one more to go for Mick Claridge. I believe this is going to be his first win of the season. Mick Claridge hasn't had the best of starts, but halfway through now, Mick Claridge finally takes P1 from the front row of the grid. The Brit wins here at Summit Point. Yeah, Michel Dudion gets P2, but for the podium, Rob Allenek is still in front of Dimitris Hudlutis, makes it before the start finish line. He comes in free for, uh, P3, Dimitrios comes home in P4, and Ovid Trangrate has to settle for fifth place. Jamie Hall is going to beat Marco Kika to the line, and Marco Arcidiacono in a tight fight here with Daniel Sadro, but Daniel just does not have enough power to get it done. Seen it. Yeah, the, the, the fight between Jamie Hall and Michael Morrison wasn't solved until yards or corner in the last lap. We go to a replay of that when Jamie Hall got a little bit loose on the braking area of turn four. They come here out of the hairpin, I think this is, uh, out of turn one. You can see them go towards turn three. Michael Morrison just putting pressure on Jamie Hall, a violet car, really trying to get a position in the last lap of the race and then coming towards the next corner. That little king, Jamie Hall, just makes a mistake under braking. He almost loses control, keeps it there, but that gives Michael Morrison the opportunity to look on the inside, put his car there, almost contact between the two there in turn five, but he makes it stick. And that's the move that gives Michael Morrison P7 in the end. That's going to complete our race, but the show is not over. We're going to have the post race after this, so stick around. We'll have all the upcoming races on screen, followed by the official results as well as driver interviews.
Welcome back to Summit Point Raceway. We just watched round six here in the Lotus 49 World Cup. And Mick Claridge finally gets his first win of the season. Michelle Dudignan follows him home in second. That start made the difference between them. We'll have to ask Mick about that when he comes to talk to us in a second. Uh, Rob Oldenick uh, finished in third. We think that's his first podium. We'll have to check on the stats on that. Dimitri Hudaloudis finishes in fourth in a close battle trying to steal it away. Ove Trangrade followed them home in fifth. Nikola Kochi managed to get sixth place with the violet car of Michael Morrison finishing seventh. He started tenth. A big game for him. Jamie Hall manages eighth with Marco Kika coming home ninth. How about from 16th to 10th from Marco Archidiacono? Rounding out our top 10, Johan. Taken for the last top 10 position by P11, Daniel Cedro. Only one and a half tenth of a second across the finish line, but just enough for Marco to get that P10. P12, uh, Ian Haycox comes home there just in front of Paul Foster. Paul Foster finishes in front of Alex Cameron, who comes home in P14. Another hard charger, winning five positions since his starting uh, position. David Rossi, after that little spin, finishes in P15. Just in front of Marcellus Bruning, our leader in the Formula 2 Championship. Andrew Eng is the last car on the lead lap in P17. And then there's a few drivers who were lapped during the race. Daniel Blackman in P18. Tobias Tingle in P19. And Matt Geomans in P20. Then in 21st, you've got Phil Lake, a disappointing finish for him. Gary Anderson in 22nd and Robert Reynolds in 23rd. Then you get to drivers who DNF'd Philip Urquhart, 24th, Don Good, 25th, Donald Dickerson, 26th, Antonio Archidiacono, 27th, and then Jeff Olney and Hideki Koivisto, 28th and 29th, retired very early in the race. We have... Our winner ready to talk to us, Mick Claridge. I saw that you were talking to Michelle about that start. We were curious, too, about what caused that wheel spin in second gear. I'm not sure that I've really seen a second gear bobble like that off the line. Oh, hi, Joe. Yeah, um, yeah. I asked him, and then I watched it in the replay, and it seemed, to, um, it seemed that he stuck in first gear, you know, right up to the, uh, to the rev limiter, and, and his second gear change was a bit lumpy, you know, so... So yeah, it can happen. I mean, there's loads of grip here, but but yeah, I wasn't expecting that. But my start was um, my start was probably one of the best ones I've ever had. I knew my first gear was a bit rubbish, but my second gear was really nice. And um, when I saw Michelle starting to wobble about a bit, I was looking to the right, and I just thought, right, I'm just going to try and flat shift in a second and see if it grips up because it's probably going to be the only chance, you know, because of track position at this track. But but yeah, no, I think that's what happened at the start. Then yeah, I think you just got unlucky with that. So for a little bit of the first part of the race, you then found yourself with Michelle right behind you. Were thoughts of the last race coming into your head and in, in the contact, or were you able to push that out of your mind? No, do you know what? I actually smiled to myself when, um, I can't remember what part of the track it was, but I, I really defended. And, um, oh, it was after the, um, you know, it's when you get around the back of the circuit on the slow right, left, right, and all the rest of it. And, um, I, I, we was just back in the old, you know, rhythm of me parking it on the apex, you know, because I knew he was going to try <laughs> and get down the inside of me. So I just, yeah, it did make me smile when I did that because we, we, Joe, we know each other so well about how we drive, you know, apart from last week, that hardly ever happens. But I mean, you know that. But no, it was a shame that he, um, that he had a bit of a messy sort of couple of laps as well. So then the, the cars behind you battled quite a bit and gave you that, that three second gap. Obviously that gave you some relief, but I saw in the chat, you had a little bit of a problem on the last lap. Can you tell us what happened there? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'll just tell you why, um, what the plan was. Um, I ran slightly higher tire pressures, um, and I knew I'd be quicker at the start than, um, than all the guys around cause the lap times are really close here. So, um, I was a bit, um, I just thought, yeah, I'd give it a try, you know, because track position and everything. And I knew I'd be a bit a bit slower at the end of, end of the race. But yeah, going into turn one, I was just saying thanks to some guy and I hit the Oculus reset button and I was like looking 45 degrees to the right, you know, as I'm going down the next straight. And that's not an easy straight when you're looking straight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I'm glad that worked out. That would have been absolutely horrible to see you lose it on the final lap. But uh, I believe, if I'm right, is this your first win this season? 
I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah, I've, I've had a I've had a few wins away from this series, you know, in the official championship. But yeah, I think this is the first GSL C win. Um, so yeah, so I really want to get sort of uh, get some sort of a rhythm going, you know, for the last races. All right. Well, hope that comes together. Congratulations. Finally taking the top step of the podium and we'll talk to you another time. Cheers, guys. That was Mick Claridge. And next up, Johan is ready to talk to the Italian who finished six, Nicola Cochi. Yeah, Nicola, welcome to the booth. Um, I was looking at your start after the race and you really made it quite intense. Free white going to turn one. That was probably not something that you were enjoying there. <laughs> yeah, hi guys. Um, that was hairy, to say the least. Uh, I I didn't expect it, like you know, you know, to have like a very aggressive moves against me in the first turn, but that happened. So I just tried to, you know, to not cut corners or nothing, nothing like that. Just trying to to be smooth on the exit, and uh, hopefully, no, you know, luckily there were no no contact, but that was sheer luck, I think. Now, of course, Summit Point is a track where it's extremely difficult to overtake. And did you put any extra emphasis on that? For example, try your quality runs a little bit extra this week to really try and make the difference there. Yeah, I, I did. Um, I, honestly, I, I was um, worried about both uh, qualifying race, um, qualifying and uh, race pace. So I, I tried to have a little bit of the uh, of both. I tried to to fiddle to adjust my setup a little bit better you know spending a, a little bit more time but honestly um it was that i i don't think i you know i gained anything about it i did a decent qualifying but not good enough i i think i lost um a tenth or so uh, somewhere around the track so i was um behind Dimitrios, but um, I, I knew that uh, the both of three, me, Dimitrios, um, Rob, and Ove, the way we were pretty close on the pace, and that what's happened in the, at least on the first half of the race. And um, I just tried to, uh, to, to, to sneak in, on the inside of Ove when he did a little bit of, of mistakes, but uh, maybe it was like a, a, a late move and when he came back, I, I've, I've been turned around and I had damage. And from now on, um, the, the car was kind of sketchy to drive. And I think I'm lucky to, to finish the race and to, to have a sixth place. Yeah, we saw that happening on the broadcast. Well, lucky to hear at least that you could continue. That was at least good. Um, what you also mentioned is that the battle between you, Rob, Demetrius, Ove for, for basically the whole first uh, two-thirds part of the race. Um, do you like a track like Summit Point in the, the Lotus 49? Is this a track that you enjoy driving and battling on because it's so different than other tracks that you might be used to? No, I don't really like it at all because uh, the car is, uh, you know, from uh, his uh, nature, the 49 is kind of uh, an animal to control. So you don't have uh, any uh, needs about some kind of uh, track that it puts it a lot even worse on that side. So uh, it, with all that bump, uh, I think is I, I think is most like super cross scale bump sometimes. And um, the, the car is very, very twitchy, and you're, you have uh, to w really work to make the car point in the right direction. So, and in the, in the middle of that, uh, you have to battle, you have to look to the mirrors, you have to defend, you have to attack, and the track is very, very narrow. So that, this doesn't allow uh, uh, us to, you know, to, to be brave or to, to, to try some... Uh, uh, some attack, some uh, overtake, because it's dangerous. So uh, you 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 really have to think it twice before doing something like that. And that's something I did not to today, and I, I pay for it. Yeah, that's uh, that's true. Well, at least you come home in P six today. Uh, fun battling out there. Good to see you fight at least uh, for for the positions. Next week at Sandford, at least that's a different kind of track. A lot different than Summit Point. Yeah, um, I kind of like Stanford, uh, but I only uh, raced there on the 79. So I don't really know how um, I was going to be with the 49, but 
um, I, I just thought to 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 come by and to to say hi to you guys because the last time in the in the Interlagos I had a very huge technical issue on my computer that I, it didn't allow me to to race good. So I <laughs> it's just uh, it's the the second time that I have some kind of issue during the race, but uh, that's something you know it's something normal have, happens for now and then. But I I just want to reassure you that I'm I'm still alive. I'm still good. Well, that's very good to hear. Good that you come here to uh, to talk with us. And once again, congratulations with uh, P6 out there today. Thank you, guys. See you next round, I hope. That was Nicola Kochi coming home in P6 out there today. In the meantime, Joe, you've caught up with the next driver. Yep, Rob Olenek, who finished third today. Rob, we're trying to check. Is this your first time finishing on the podium in the, in the 49 on our broadcast? Uh, absolutely. I don't even think I've been close. <laughs> Is... Is there something special about uh, this track for you? Because uh, we've seen you have good pace, but you were fighting up at the top, not only here in the race, but in warm up in the practice session, we saw that you had good pace too. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I like the track. I don't think I was quite as fast as Mick and Michelle, but they were battling in the front. And uh, Ove and I, I think we're just kind of sitting there waiting for something to happen. And, uh, Kind of did what Michelle went off a little bit. We got ahead of him. I don't even remember how I got around Ove, but I couldn't believe when I was in second place. Started getting nervous at that point. <laughs> well, it didn't finish in second, but you still managed to get third. Real quick before you go, uh, I'm curious about this tiger stripe paint. Where did this come from? I don't even know. I was just trying to come <laughs> up with some kind of paint, and I was just searching online, and I was like, maybe that'll look cool. So I just kind of put it on it. I'm probably going to be switching to like a dirty torque paint at some point, but try and make it like a classic theme. There you go. Oh, you got to represent dirty torque coming over from camel. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, congratulations on a third. Sorry. It's got to be a little bit short. We went long on the other interviews and we're trying to get to uh, some of our other top drivers. Congratulations, sir. Okay. Thanks. See you guys. That was Rob Olenek, uh, who gets his first podium here. Up next, uh, Johan has caught up with fourth place, Dimitri Hudeludis. Yeah, Dimitrios, welcome to the booth. Um, you started in P4, you finished in P4, but it was everything except a very boring race for you. That was exciting. Yeah, it's uh, great uh, to be back on a broadcast race. It's been a while. Um, I think I could have been a little bit faster, but I didn't manage to uh, get back home uh, uh, early enough to get uh, around an hour of practice. I only did uh, around 10 minutes. So the first half of the race, I kept I kept a little bit. Uh, I made a huge mistake on uh, turn one. Thankfully, I kept it uh, on the on the tarmac. And uh, the second half of the race, I think it uh, my pay, I, I was much faster. And my pace improved after I got uh, accustomed to, to the track. I think I, I could have been a little bit b better. I felt strong in this uh, part, in this track. Uh, yeah, this. Yeah, well, especially if you tell tell that, like, if you do this, this these results with, with not a lot of practice, that's some good positive that you will take forward to the rest of the season. Yeah, I mean, I practiced uh, during the week and I already had one race, uh, but... Um, you already know, guys, that uh, if you want to race on the L49, you cannot uh, jump uh, right away and uh, have a race. Uh, a little bit of practice is needed before uh, the start of a race. So, yeah, uh, in the end, uh, I'm confident I had a good race, a clean one, a great, great fight, uh, intense, uh, or, uh, intense racing. So I'm very happy, yes. Very good. Well, that's great to hear. Well, congratulations once again with getting P4, and I hope to see you again next week in Salford. Uh, see you, Hans. See you guys. That was Dimitrios Hudelud is coming home in P4 today. Now, you have, in the meantime, caught up with us, uh, our last driver of today, Joe. Yep. Michael Morrison is back again this season, going from 10th to 7th. Michael, it looked like it was a very tough time in the middle of the pack. This is probably a few more cars than you're used to being in the field. Yeah, it was. There are surprisingly few back markers to deal with. There are just two or three of our usual subjects, and I didn't really. And we used to solve them multiple times, and they just stayed well out of the way. It was contributed to them getting lapped so much. But yeah, uh, other than the very last lap and the very first lap, when there was a accordion, in fact, in front of me, and I saw the accordion before everyone else did and was able to avoid it by just 
<laughs> almost getting on the brakes at the middle of the apex of the uh, uh, Swiss back corners. So, yeah, and obviously the last lap, you guys did a great job of uh, picking up after the finish of a race. So, yeah. Oh, we talked to Nicola Kochi asking if he likes this track and feels the car is suited to it. Uh, I mentioned at the at the start of the broadcast that it feels like an old school track with the, the earth and embankments and the trees right next to the course. But how do you feel from inside the car? Yeah, uh, Nicola described it pretty well. It just uh, exasperates the nature of a car and it either makes it a lot more stressful to drive or it makes it a lot more fun and or a combination of both. So. Yeah, I, I, I like it. So we have a, a vote for the positive. Next round, we're heading to Zandvoort, which is another tricky track with, that's got a lot of technical portions, but is where this car actually raced in real life. How are you looking forward to that? Yeah, I, I think this is, yeah, Zandvoort is one of two tracks I was able to keep up with Mick for more than two laps. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Well, excellent. We hope to see you fighting for a podium up there, and uh, we'll see you in one week's time. All right, thanks. That's Michael Morrison managing a seventh today. And we're going to close up before we go. Of course, we want to thank the Lotus 49 community for bringing Global Sim Racing Channel back for coverage, as well as to iRacing for bringing us onto the iRacing Esports Network. Make sure and subscribe to them. There's a big red button that says subscribe that's so you can catch everything on their channel. Thanks to the companies that provide the software and hardware for our broadcast listed here on your screen. Additional thanks go to Eric Ekholm and June Lalonde who provide our wonderful music. See the screen for how to get a hold of more of their great work. Thanks to the team today, Johan, Amjad, and Dougie. If you'd like to find out more about GSRC, including upcoming races, you can find it at GlobalSimRacingChannel.com. You can also check us out on social media. We're on Twitter at GSR Channel, Facebook at Global Sim Racing Channel, and Instagram at GSRC underscore Graham. If you head on over to our YouTube page, over to GSRC, there's that big red subscribe button. Again, hit that for our page, and you won't miss a moment here on the GSRC. As we mentioned, the next round is going to be Zandvoort. That'll be Saturday, October 27th at 9.30 a.m. Eastern. We also have upcoming races for other series listed on the screen, so check them out and mark them down on your calendar. However, right now here on the iRacing Esports Network, you can go over and check out the World Championship, the finale. Make sure and see what action is happening over there. Until next time, race clean, race hard, and we'll see you on the track.